All right, let's take a peek here and see if we went live. Okay, let's see if we went on. Let me go ahead and give it a check. Looks like we're live. All right, so I think that I put the wrong subtitle on this sucker, but I will go ahead and edit that afterwards. So if you're coming back and watching the recording, you're not gonna see this. Um, but I did wanna talk a little bit today about considerations for making the good faith certification for the PPP 7A. I had a couple of questions on this yesterday. So I figured I would cover that today. I put together a little document as well, some of the ways that I see it. So we're gonna go through that. But before we do, let's go ahead and start things the way things should always be started. Well, I guess the Q and A call at least. A little national anthem action, is everybody ready? Now I'm gonna to try to start from the beginning. Last couple of times I've done it, I started sort of in the middle. I can never really remember, but we're gonna give it a try, okay? Um, might have been the best one because I had you know I started at the actual beginning went all the way through and my lips were that perfect combination of a little bit wet but not too wet and not too dry where I didn't have any stumbles you know those of you guys that have been following the national anthem every once in a while I try to hit that high note and it just <laughs> it just crackles out right um okay so today we are going to be covering the good faith certification some considerations for that and I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen let me see here and so basically guys you know b before I share my screen I'll kind of uh, preface this and, and uh, show you and you can put any comments that you want in the chat what I'm about to go through today is just my perspective okay and I've talked to a number of different attorneys about this I've seen different people's opinions in the group I've read the guidance I'm not going to tell you that you know if you do this exact set of steps, that this is going to be the right way to do it in every circumstance. Um, these are just some considerations and some things that I think make sense based on the attorneys that I've talked to. These are the things that we did at our company. Um, and, you know, I've had people reach out. I had somebody on the Q&A call yesterday ask about how to make these good faith certifications for clients and how, how to advise them on making these good faith certifications. But then also, how to make them for yourself, you know, how to make them for yourself. And so um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and walk through with you guys a little bit about how I've been thinking about this. And so let's see if we can't go on the widescreen here. Okay, so considerations in making a good faith certification for the PPP 7A. Okay, so a couple of disclosures, you know, you are, if you're working with a client, right, you are not, um, making the certification for them. And I would not recommend that you tell them what to do, okay? They need to make their own decision based on their circumstances, but you can help them sort of craft out some considerations. And that's what I'm gonna do with you here in a second, right? So, and the other reason why this is, uh, you know, important video to get out today is May 1st, and there is a deadline to uh, pay back any of these amounts by May 7th. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So we've got about six days left on that. I said, you cannot and should not, as an accountant, tell them what to do. You can, however, help them work through the considerations. Below are a number of items for them to consider. Once they've gone through the items, they should get in touch with their attorney for them to make a final determination. And I do think that that is a smart thing to do, and you will see that at the end as well. So as part of the application process for the PPP under the CARES Act, each borrower was required to make a specific set of certifications included those required certifications uh, included in those required certifications was a certification that 
And then this is basically straight from the CARES Act. Okay. Now I believe, and I wasn't planning on pulling this up, so let's see if I can find it. If we look at the actual uh, borrower application form, I believe these certifications were, are they down here? Yep, down here. So current economic, used to maintain, you know, workers and so on. And so these certifications were here. Now, not everybody filled one of these out, right? Because sometimes the banks had different forms and whatnot. But um, I think a lot of people or most filled out, obviously everybody filled out this form in some way. It's just a matter of if uh, it looked exactly like this or not, okay? So that's the certifications there. Um, and this stuff has been in the news a lot. You guys have seen companies like, you know, Shake Shack, I think, and the New York Lakers, or, or no, <laughs> New York Lakers, the LA Lakers, uh, you know, repay some of their loans because of some of these things, okay? So, you know, there's these key things. So an eligible uh, recipient applying for a covered loan shall make the following good face, or shall, ma uh, shall make a good faith certification that the uncertainty of economic conditions makes necessary the loan request to support the ongoing operations of the recipient. Now, this is really the key sentence in this. Um, and let's let's pick this apart. That the uncertainty of current economic conditions, okay, makes necessary the loan request to support the ongoing operations of the eligible recipient. Okay, so that is really the key that a lot of people are having questions on and that is getting brought up a lot in the news. And obviously there's a lot of judgment around that. And I'm gonna show you guys how I think about unpacking that and not giving anybody a specific determination or decision, just like I don't think I don't think you should do that for your clients, but have them weigh the different ways to look at it. And I'll show you that in uh, as we get through this. Acknowledging that funds will be used to retain workers and maintain payroll or make mortgage payments, lease payments and utility payments. Um, you know, that's part of there as well. And that's pretty straightforward. I think, you know, uh, you know, we've communicated with all the clients about the nature of the loan, what it's supposed to be used for, how it's calculated and how forgiveness is also calculated. Uh, that eligible recipient does not have an application pending for a loan under this subsection for the same purpose and duplicative amounts applied for or received under a covered loan. So you can't have more than one. Okay. Um, and, and does not have an application pending. Now, that was kind of something that we kind of went through um, through the process. When this bill first came out, I think some people kind of took this like, oh, you can't apply in multiple places. But what we've really come to learn is that probably is referencing like the E-Tran, that point of the E-Tran at the actual SBA. So you can apply at all these different banks, and but if you, you don't want to have multiple E-Tran numbers in there. You don't want to have multiple loans. And so during the period February 15th uh, and ending on December 31st, 2020, that the eligible recipient has not received amounts under the section for the same purpose or duplicative amounts applied for and received under a covered loan. So this also is kind of covering that whole EIDL, like if they receive an EIDL, they can't use it for payroll. That's kind of what that's getting at as well. Um, but I think, you know, these sentences here, I don't think is where a lot of the questioning has come from, at least not from those of you in the community asking me, where a lot of the questions have come is really on this sentence here, okay? Um, and there are key few points that I think need to be considered for clients. So obviously current economic conditions make this loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations. Additionally, they have to certify that the uh, proceeds are gonna go to these amounts, which you know I, we all kind of have that plan with the clients as well. And that's how they're gonna be able to be forgiven. Uh, but there has been some subsequent guidance, okay? There's been some subsequent guidance. So let's look at, let's read through some of these. Um, However, now more than 25% of the loan forgiveness may be attributable to non-payroll costs. So that was something that came out where it says, okay, so you know you can't do it on all these other amounts. You have to still do it on majority of payroll. While the act provides that borrowers are eligible for forgiveness in an amount equal to the sum of payroll costs and any payments of mortgage interest, rent, utilities, the administrator has determined that non-payroll portion of the giver loan should be limited to effectuate the core purpose of the statute and ensure the finite program resources are devoted primarily to payroll. The administrator has determined in consultation with the secretary that 75% is an appropriate amount. So I think this is key because when they say payroll, that was kind of a, a little bit of an addition here that, you know, these amounts are on there, but, you know, you've really got to be using it for the majority of payroll. And we've seen that for a few weeks now, it, you know, and we don't have the final, final forgiveness process, although we have a lot of information. I'm not going to be covering all that today, but it's likely that you're gonna to have to be making some additional certifications at point of forgiveness, right? And they're probably going to be on these same points, whether or not they're expanded, we will have to see. 
Um, but it looks like we're going to have to be making some additional certifications at that point as well. And when those forms comes out, comes out, we will obviously uh, you know get those out to everybody. Okay, there's and then there's a couple of FAQs, and you know I saw a really funny meme on was it on Twitter somewhere where somebody was saying it was like a I don't know if it was like a dating meme or something, but originally it might have been like a dating meme. And it was saying something like you're changing the rules again, and then the person said it's like the Treasury with the PPP every day. And you know, it is kind of true because they rolled the program out so quickly and then they roll out all these FAQs, like they they change the way that they look at kind of, you know, all these little nuanced details of the execution of this, right? Because these were very vague statements in the bill, then they have to go and implement all this. And so there's a couple of relevant FAQs to the good faith certification that I want to walk through. Okay, so here's, here's the first one, uh, FAQ number 31. And by the way, I've, I've linked all these and I will paste these in the, um, uh, post when I am done with this. Do businesses owned by large companies with adequate sources of liquidity to support the business's ongoing operations qualify for a PPP loan? And that's the question. The answer is, in addition to reviewing applicable affiliation rules to determine eligibility, all borrowers must assess their economic need for a PPP loan under the standard established by the CARES Act and the PPP regulations at the time of application. Now, uh, one really key thing here, I think, is at the time of application, at the time of loan application, okay? So given what has happened over the last couple of weeks, and, and I guess now we're into months because it's really started in March, then April, now we're into May, um, you know, that date of the loan application is really going to be a key date for you to uh, start to, you know, explore the, with the client. And I'm going to tell you how to explore that and document that in a second, but that's a key point. Although the CARES Act suspends the ordinary requirement for borrowers to be unable to obtain credit elsewhere, Borrowers must certify in good faith that their PPP loan request is necessary. Specifically before submitting, all borrowers should review carefully the required certification that, quote, this goes back to our important sense there, current economic uh, uncertainty makes this loan request necessary to support the ongoing uh, operations of the applicant. Borrowers must make the certification in good faith, taking into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. OK, so, you know, this is a really important sentence as well. And this is where evaluation needs to come in. So let's read it again. Borrowers must make the certification in good faith, taking into account their current business activity and their ability to access other sources of liquidity sufficient to support their ongoing operations in a manner that is not significantly detrimental to the business. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep going through this, but I think that's an important consideration. You know, um, current business activity, it's a very key word here, access to other sources of liquidity, and then sufficient to support their ongoing operations, okay, in a manner that's not significantly detrimental to the business. Now, all of these words require judgment, and that's where we come in in allowing our clients to be able to flesh out their judgment and eventually work with an attorney to be able to flesh out that judgment. Okay. So, for example, it is unlikely that a public company with a substantial market value and access to capital markets will be able to make the required certification in good faith. Now, this FAQ came out, I believe, the same day or the day after uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin was on CNBC, and he said that he was really uh, happy to see Shake Shack paying back the loan, and I think there were conversations about Harvard having taken loans and also uh, the Lakers, and these all happened at different points in time, but that's why they kind of snuck this in here. Now, that does not mean, in my mind, that just because... Um, someone's not a public company that they're fine. It's just important to understand why this particular FAQ was written. And you can tell that by this sentence here. And as such, a company should pre be prepared to demonstrate to the SBA upon request the basis for its certification. And that's really the key. I think every single person here, you, the, the mindset that you need to have, okay, is that you, if, if you're doing a, a PPP loan certification for your company, or if your client is doing one for their company, the individual that is making that certification should be prepared to submit documentation and should be prepared to, I, I think of it almost like a deposition. Like, are you prepared to substantiate these claims in a deposition? Okay. Lenders may rely on a borrower certification regarding the necessity of the loan request. Okay. Um, so that means like, and I, as we've seen that the lenders aren't really doing any investigation there. They're just taking the check the box, you know, as, you know, sort of a, the process. Now, we we haven't seen on the back end of this, on the forgiveness side, if there's going to be a much larger or much deeper amount of um, investigation. We don't know yet. But, you know, 
uh, on the front end, uh, they're not looking at that at all. They're not requesting any documentation for this. They're just simply relying on the certification in the application. Any borrower that applied for the PPP loan prior to the issuance of this guidance and repays the loan in full by May 7th will be deemed by the SBA to have made the required certification in good faith. Okay. So basically, they're kind of giving people an out um, because they, they're basically going easy on like, you know, I, and again, I don't know the specific financial conditions asso associated with a Shake Shack or others. And I've seen people break down some of these uh, bigger companies where, you know, oh, they look good because they returned it. But really, if you break it down, I think Shake Shack had something like a $10 million loan. There was, it would have only been about $50,000 per location. And each worker would have got about $150 a week or something. I don't know. My point is, it's going to be different based on every single business. So the reason I bring that up is because, you know, some of these companies are using the return of these loans as almost like a virtue signaling. But when you dig into it, well, there really was no fi big financial benefit to that company. In addition, because they fired a lot of workers that they wouldn't be bringing back, that would further hit the forgiveness of the loan. So, you know, whether or not these companies are returning it because they don't feel they need to, they don't need the money, they don't feel it makes sense for them financially. The Treasury basically said, look, as long as you return the money by May 7th, we're really not even going to look into this. At least it's what it seems here. Now, I, of course, they can look into anything they want, whenever they want, even if they said they're not going to look into it, right? So, you know, I think you never, when you're doing things with the government, you got to understand they've got all the power, they've got all the control. That's part of the reason why they made these loans and not grants. And so, again, I just go back to that image in your mind of, are you prepared to be in a deposition and answer this? Now, the likelihood of our clients being in a deposition is low, but I think it's a helpful frame of mind. Like, you know, would you be willing to, and, and there's been a lot of talk um, in different communities about, okay, you know, you, Mr. Business Owner, are probably not going to end up on CNN or CNBC or Fox Business News or any of these things like Shake Shack did. But what about your local community? You know, the information about everybody that took these loans will be public. Okay. So it, if you are taking the loan, okay, and there's other businesses in your local community that didn't get the loan, is the local media going to hate on you? Can you handle the PR risk? Can you handle that? Um, and that that is a consideration. That is a consideration. And are they prepared to substantiate that? Okay. And that's the biggest thing is the preparation. And, and we're going to get into that here in a second. Okay. I'm just going over the guidance right now, and then I'll show you uh, my thoughts on how to approach it. And I linked all this as well. Um, another one of the FAQs. So this was another really interesting one that came out. Um, will the SBA review individual PPP loan files? Okay. So again. Uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin goes on CNBC and he says um, that he's going to be reviewing all loans over $2 million. Now, I saw that on CNBC in real time. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, well, that's not anywhere in the guidance. And then literally it was either the same later that day they came out with this exact FAQ. So that's why I like watching things on Twitter or I like watching, you know, at least policymakers or, you know, people like a Marco Rubio, people like a Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, people like a Larry Kudlow. When they go on, they're basically signaling the direction of policy, and you often see these things a couple of hours or a couple of days ahead of time before they end up here. Now, you can't act on what a Treasury Secretary says on CNBC, but it gets you a little bit prepared, and that's exactly what happened here. So he says, yes, in FAQ 31, the SBA reminded all borrowers of an important certification required to obtain the loan. To further ensure the PPP loans are limited to eligible borrowers in need, the SBA has decided in consultation with the Department of the Treasury that it will review all loans in excess of $2 million in addition to other loans as appropriate. Okay, so let's watch this. It will review all loans. Now, the reality of it is, guys, is there going to be some review over all loans? Okay, so it's just that when you look at his specific wording here, he's saying the SBA has decided in consultation with the Treasury that it will review all loans. Okay, so that he, what he's saying here is the SBA will review all loans. If somebody got a PPP that was like $15,000 or I guess in this case, anything below $2 million, uh, probably the bank is going to be reviewing that. And then they're just going to be telling the SBA like, yeah, this is going to be forgiven. And the SBA is just going to say, okay, fine. But if the loan is over 2 million, what they're saying is that loan package, that forgiveness package will go to the SBA for a review. And they will also review other loans as appropriate. I would guess. And, and you know, one of the things I'll say is that as this program grows, on one hand, you would think the scrutiny would get worse. But I kind of don't think that that's the case because as the program grows, you're just going to have so much more volume with the same department. It's not going to be able to handle it. If the program doesn't grow that much and let's say the economy really recovers well, I think there'll be more scrutiny over these programs. 
uh, because the you know they will be looking for something to uh, sort of dig into. If this program continues on, if they keep adding other programs, if the economy deteriorates, then I think there's probably going to be less scrutiny on this because they're going to be on to the next fire and trying to put it out. So at this point, we don't know. I would be prepared for them to ratchet that two million down, though. Ratchet it down to a million. Ratchet it down to five hundred thousand. You know, we don't know what it's going to end up being, and that we don't know if they'll do you know like a random selection of others. If somebody in your local, if, if, if a business owner in your local town got a PPP, okay, and then somebody in the town says, hey, he shouldn't have got that PPP, and they report them, he needs to be prepared to answer to that to the SBA. That'll probably happen in some uh, instances. And so, you know, the uh, following the lender submission of the borrower's loan uh, forgiveness application, additional guidance implementing this procedure will be forthcoming. Okay, so the outcome of the SBA's uh, and so you can see here, additional guidance on implementing this procedure will be forthcoming. So I think we're going to see more. Um, it's just a matter of, are we going to see more before May 7th and so on? Um, the outcome of the SBA's review of loan files will not affect the SBA's guarantee of any loan for which the lend lender has complied with the lender obligations set forth in the paragraph, so on and so forth. Okay, link to that as well. Now, there was another question that came in, which, you know, it's interesting how they do these questions because, you know, in my mind, there are questions that are more important than sometimes the ones they put on here, but I think they're probably not ready to let some out. And I think they obviously have much greater visibility into uh, questions than we do and other priorities. So either way, this was another question. Do businesses owned by private companies with adequate sources of liquidity to support businesses ongoing operations qualify for a PPP loan? And you know, then it just said C response 31, which we've already read, okay? so. Again, another consideration to uh, put in mind with the client, okay? So now I wanna come down here to the key considerations, okay? So, you know, this is where my thought process comes in. And like I said before, I am not guaranteeing you that if you do all of this, that, you're, that your client will not either have to repay the loan or will have been considered to not have acted in good faith. However, this is how, I think about this issue. This is how we thought about it at our company and the process that we went through. Okay. So let's walk through this step by step. So I, I think the key word here for you and talking with your clients is considerations, considerations. These are key considerations. You should not tell them these are the key steps to ensure you have a good faith certification, or these are the key steps to ensure you get the loan forgiven. These are things to consider. Ultimately, they are responsible for making the good faith certification. Ultimately, they are responsible for allocating that money in a way that gets it forgivable. And whatever certifications come at that point, they are responsible for that. But we can help them make some considerations. So I think this was sort of a detailed list that I put together and we'll walk through now. So I think, and, and by the way, all of this, I would put into a, uh, I would recommend to that business owner that they put it into a memo. Um, and you know they could even use many of the things in this document as some components of the outline for that memo. Okay, so I think one of the first things to consider is what was the previous business that you had before the crisis? I think that's very important. You know, many of these businesses were physical locations. You know, some of these businesses were not, they were totally remote and virtual. Some of these businesses, had significant exposure to industries that were hit, even though they themselves might not have been hit, okay? Um, so like, for example, uh, you know, if a anybody pretty much that serviced restaurants, like I was talking to somebody, we were interviewing somebody the other day that uh, was working at a software company that focused on restaurants, well, they got annihilated, you know? And so their business, I think, was down maybe 60%, 70% and, and collapsing, and so, you know, really digging into and being thoughtful about what business did we have before this crisis and what are what is the specific nature of any disruption that we saw okay or that we might have seen just given the nature of that business and while this seems basic i think again how would you respond to these considerations in a deposition how would the client respond to it like that's the question i would be asking them okay what happened in the weeks leading up so I think this is really important and I think it's super important to encourage these guys to write all of this down right freaking now because I can tell you in November, by the time November comes around, the number of crazy things that will have happened in this world will be insane probably given how it's how things have gone so far. 
and they're not going to remember everything that happened in March. I mean, heck, they're still, even if they write things down right now, they're not going to remember everything. Okay. So I want to know, you know, when you look at like, it was really that weekend in March. I don't remember the exact dates, like March 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, where to me, it felt like the general sort of psyche of America was changing, right? And, you know, you can even see it here. I mean, you could even track it alongside, you know, the jobless numbers. I think the day we went remote was March 13th. Okay, so that date, that March 13th date, I think was a Friday. And then just look at that jobless claims number. And again, you know, there was almost nothing before that. And then it just went insane. Okay. And so I think what was their mentality in those days? What was their mentality in those weeks? What emails did they receive? What, what things happened to them? How did they view the world? What happened to their team? Did they go remote? What type of disruption? You know, I was talking to somebody, you know, in our uh, program who said, yeah, we were planning on going remote over the next two years, but we had to do it in two days. And, you know, now we've got, you know, a $6,000 a month lease payment that we don't need. And, and among many other, you know, aspects of business disruption. And so again, you know, everybody's got their own story. The key is getting that written down and documented now, because you will forget all the nuanced details, especially if we do see a, a big recovery. You know, if there ends up being a bigger recovery than what I would think is going to happen, then I think, um, there has the potential to be more scrutiny over this because like, well, hey, you know, your business didn't get as bad as you thought. And that's certainly possible. Okay. So I think really being clear about what happened in the weeks leading up. And I would say the weeks leading up to, uh, up to the certification, really, you know, like that date, whatever that date was. Now, remember the PPP, you were first able to apply, I believe it was April 3rd. Okay. But there were some banks that were kind of receiving things the day before, but they were receiving like documentation. I don't know that anybody was really receiving applications until April 3rd, but I'm not going to speak for every single bank. It's possible on April 1st or 2nd, because I believe the, um, the uh, borrower forms came out a day or two before April 3rd. So in the weeks and days leading up to that April 3rd date, and then they might not have applied on April 3rd, right? Maybe they applied on April 4th or April 7th, or, you know, now it's still, people can apply today, right? May 1st. So what was their mentality leading up to that? Okay. And then I think they also need to specifically document financial loss. Okay. So, um, you know, when you look at financial loss, what lost revenue came as a result of the crisis in the month of March? And, you know, some people were affected even earlier because, uh, I know, for example, I spoke with a business owner. He did about six million in sales, and he had a uh, business where I think they imported various types of copper materials for I don't know some type of construction or something. And he was affected all the way back in January and February because of production delays out of China. So you know, th this is like every business is going to be different, but we want to make a, a consideration of lost revenue. Okay, uh, we also want to make a consideration of lost customers. So you know, okay, so they didn't get, let's say new clients and the, the revenue can be new clients or existing. And then did they have people that were paying, but paused or stopped or canceled or asked for a return or canceled agreements? You know, I remember I had this really vivid memory of when things really started to get bad, where I saw a guy who does a big software conference out in California, who was really hating on, I think it was Marriott or Hilton or something saying that they wouldn't uh, forgive him the $700,000 for the event. And Marriott lost that customer, $700,000 customer. He lost a lot of customers for that event. So, but, you know, we need to get them to really make sure that they have that clearly documented because they might not remember, or maybe the documentation is not as clear. And I think also, um, what were all the pending contracts? Because that event, it's not like that event happened and he owed the money. That event was about to happen. And so he probably lost revenue that he would have had otherwise. And so I think loss of, of new revenue and loss of existing customers, I think need to be documented in detail. Also, what additional expenses came up, right? So what things are not being used, right? So like if somebody has, I mean, think about the commercial space right now that's not being used. I mean, it's just everywhere, right? So, I mean, there's so much commercial space that's not being used, okay? And then what kind of new expenses? So if you look at it, like, um, you know, I use that example of somebody that had $6,000 a month of a lease payment on an office. Now they go remote in two days instead of two, two years. And now every single month they're paying that 6,000, they're paying that utilities, they're paying that cleaning or whatever the combination of things are. And in addition to that, they have new expenses. 
um, which are related to basically going remote, right? And I think I saw, I mean, this is a big example, but I think it was Morgan Stanley or Bank of America or somewhat, some of these huge banks purchased 90,000 laptops in one week. I mean, that is obscene, right? But, you know, everybody has their own version of that. Uh, many people purchased different types of software to work remote, work virtually. Many people didn't have Zooms. You know, many people didn't have enough laptops. People had desktops before. So, you know, there was, there's a lot of things there that were specifically related to that, okay? Also, because of that disruption, what type of litigation or future litigation resulted or could result in the future as a result of that disruption? I mean, because, you know, a lot of people, they fired a lot of employees, right? What kind of litigation are they going to be looking at down the line as a result of that? Or maybe they, you know, there's all sorts of things, right? I mean, I, I think that, and they've been talking a lot about this, the politicians, policymakers, that, you know, how do we protect business owners from liability with the virus, right? I mean, you know, I remember in our office, there was a couple of days near the end there where people didn't feel comfortable working in the office because one guy had a cough. Now that guy's had a cough since he was about three months, three, three, 30 minutes old. He's had a cough since he was a little baby. He's, he's uh, you know, always been that way. But again, coughing now seems so. And what if that turns out, oh, somebody did get sick. So again, you know, these are the little, there's so many nuanced details of litigation related to the virus and related to the business disruption, related to how it was handled, related to how people were treated, related to uh, now, oh, not to mention all the cybersecurity risks. You know, that's another thing too. I mean, could there be, if, if you, and I've seen a lot of businesses not handling this well, where, you know, businesses are telling their employees, hey, do you have a laptop? Because we don't want to purchase it. And then people say, yes, I have a laptop. Okay. So what type of cybersecurity and data information risks are there? I think you're going to see in the next couple of years, big problems with that. I mean, you know, I saw Robert Herjavec, the guy on Shark Tank, he was saying that, you know, this is like a hacker's golden age right now. And it's true. I mean, literally the amount of technological disruption that has put all these businesses remote. So again, I think that some of these are going to be clearer than others. I mean, you know, most people, let's say, don't have a litigation issue, but are there other people where, based on what has gone on with their business, they have a potential future litigation that has come up as a result of this and they don't know about it. Um, I think it's a key consideration. I also think access to other liquidity and for what time frame needed. So, you know, they talked about access to other liquidity. And I think, you know, the important thing is, you know, people have access to whatever cash is in their bank account. They might have access to a credit card. They might have access to a line of credit. They might have access to personal funds, you know, so on and so forth. But how long would that last? And how long would that last if they had a 20% reduction in sales? How long would that last if they had a 50 or a 75? And, and to be honest, I think that they really need to do the analysis based on a 100% reduction in revenues. I mean, you know, it's weird to say that, but I am always shocked. I mean, every week I learn about a new industry with a 100% drop in revenue. And I'm just like, well, I mean, this is insane. You know, you, know, you always think 100% is like not going to happen. You think it's almost cuckoo, but it, it really is like a sci-fi movie right now. I mean, it, it is insanity. And so I think it's first off, what other access uh, to liquidity do they have? But I think in regards to that, it's what time frame. You know, when they look at their business, do they see the risks of this virus in their business? Like I see, I talk to some people that are like, ah, this is totally fake. It's going to be over in one month. Okay, so that's that business owner's frame of mind. They might not think their business is going to be affected. It's going to be over in one month. Okay, well, what about somebody else where they think, well, gee, I've got a restaurant and this is going to hit me for 18 months. Or what if somebody that says, well, gee, this hasn't hit me yet, but if this goes on for six months, I think it will. Okay. Or what if somebody thinks this could be 24 to 36 months? So I think that when you look at these situations, it's again, I think good faith has a lot to do with what does that business owner see in their own situation? Okay. So it's not black and white. It has to do with judgment. And it's more important that they're making good faith judgment than what the, the specific facts are, okay? Um, the specific facts are relevant and need to be considered individually and in unison to make that final consideration, okay? So projection of loss if, and this is, this is a key one too. So what is the projection of loss if COVID never had happened? So do you, were you already seeing a loss in your business? Was your business already collapsing? Or, you know, were things relatively stable? And so what if COVID didn't happen? Like where would the business have been? Okay. Or were you even growing? Right. And what if COVID happened, which it did, and you were able to successfully pivot the business to a new environment? So like I saw, 
um, a lot of these guys, and we've seen this in the, uh, the work that we've been doing with a lot of the COVID consulting, is you see a company like Alendio, right? Lendio, I, I read up some of their story. Their business was suffering, but they pivoted to help with this SBA stuff and their business exploded. I mean, it's I don't know what it is because they don't have their numbers out, but I can almost guarantee you that their business is way bigger than it was before this crisis. But at least from what the CEO said, if they hadn't pivoted, their business would have tanked and they would have had to do layoffs. And so I think that's an interesting consideration. Like COVID happened and you were able to successfully pivot your business, but what if you weren't? And also what if there's a second outbreak in the fall? So with that company, it's like, okay, like let's say you pivoted it successfully, but what if there's a second outbreak in the fall? Or like, you know, what if, and this is the last one here, what if it happened and you were not able to successfully pivot the business? And so some of you guys have asked me about this uh, for your clients. And then I also had uh, Ian Scholl yesterday asked me about this for his clients and for him. And so I said, or he said for accounting firm owners. And I said, again, it goes back to good judgment. You know, you have to make good judgment about your situation and you have to make a good faith certification. I'm not gonna tell anybody what you need to do, but I'm gonna show you how to make the final decision here in a second, or at least how to think about making the final decision, some considerations. But I do think that thinking about all these scenarios are key because just because a business pivoted and succeeded. I mean, like many of us in this group, you guys pivoted your business from, you know, tax planning, CFO services, tax preparation, bookkeeping and accounting into some of this COVID consulting. But that brought with it a whole slew of new risks and a whole slew of new investments and a whole slew of new revenue. But at the same time, you know, very few of us are thinking that that's going to be our long term business. And very few of us are thinking, oh, we're going to be doing this in five years or three years or and I think none of us think we'll be doing it the same way in three months than we have in the last three months. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty there. And I think with the when you're talking to these business owners, some of these guys have pivoted to takeout. They've pivoted to telehealth. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of different businesses um, and some of them experienced a decline in sales and then a resurgence. I think a lot of people in this community, what I've seen is you had an initial decline in sales followed by an initial, uh, followed by a subsequent spike in sales related to the pivot. But there are people in the group that just saw a decline in sales and just didn't do anything. And, you know, I saw a really good note from uh, one attorney that I was reading who was saying that, well, what if somebody did pivot their business? And he was talking about how, well, that honestly is probably in the spirit of PPP. Like PPP wants to get these businesses going again. They want to get them running. And so if somebody pivoted their business and didn't end up seeing as much disruption as, as they would have if they didn't, that's probably something that everybody should try to do. And so that doesn't necessarily in and of itself, in, you know, in their mind, at least impair that good faith certification. But again, it has to be taken as a whole. So I think another really key part of this that was mentioned in the FAQs is certification as part at, at the time of the application. You know, that to me is really key because my gosh, April 3rd and, you know, May 1st, aren't those very different times? Like, those are completely different time periods. Like, I mean, things happened, you know, there was a period there where every day there was so many things that were different. I mean, you know, I think we started helping people with the EIDL work, you know, in like maybe like March 16th or something. Um, but, you know, what happened from March 16th to April 3rd, staggering, staggering. I mean, really absolutely insane. And so I think that, you know, when you look at that time period, like what was the exact day? What was the, what happened on that day? What happened in those days leading up that led that business owner to make that good faith certification? Okay. I think that's, that is very important. So think on the specific date that they made it. And if you, if there were many applications that went out, I think it's probably safe to consider all, but specifically consider the application that was approved. Because you might have, a, you might have submitted applications on different days, right? Because a lot of you guys are like, oh, they're at Chase crap, Chase isn't going to work. Then you applied somewhere else, got approved somewhere else. I'd consider both, but I'd really focus on that date that the application was certified that was actually finally approved. And what were their outlook of future risks and uncertainties at that date on the virus? I would say on the economy, on their financial issues, on societal unrest, on litigation. Like, did they put thoughtful consideration into all these things? And think about the timeline of 
the uncertainty? Like, is this something that they foresaw in their industry, in their business going on for a few days, a few months, a potentially a few years? Like, what, how did that business owner see it? And, you know, really document the employees, like who, who have been or who could have been terminated. And, you know, we've already got to do this for the forgiveness, but there are all these businesses out there where they made decisions on terminations. Okay. So they made decisions on terminations right away. They made decisions on terminations. Like I saw, I, I was messaging a woman um, two nights ago who went through the full interview process with us like four months ago, decided not to take the job with us. You know, she was great. Couldn't get her. And she messaged me back two nights ago and said, oh, they did layoffs and now I've got another role and she wanted back in, but we already found somebody else who's actually better than her now. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I bring that up because these layoffs are not done, right? And so what was their thinking on round one? What was their thinking on wave two? What was their thinking on wave three? And, you know, really make sure that that is documented. And that should have been documented just from an HR perspective, but you know, it's freaking coronavirus time. So who knows, you know, people have done not, not probably as sufficient as could be. How many employees will be saved with the PPP loan? You know, there's no way to know. I hear the government keeps saying these numbers like 30 to 50 million people's jobs have been saved. I, I mean, they're obviously just throwing those numbers out based on uh, projections and estimates. But, you know, these individual business owners can really give a pretty good estimate of those, you know, those numbers for their business, especially when you consider the time frame. Like, can they return operations? Can a dentist get back to work in May, June, July? What's the recovery and revenue there? And because of that PPP loan, how long will that go? So I think documenting that and, you know, that's part of their considerations. Like, oh, I had to terminate people and I could bring this many people back. Or I haven't had to terminate anybody, but if I got the PPP loan and negative things happen, I could extend that period for quite some time. Um, and I think also, you know, when you look at that, determination right there, how many employees will be saved. The most important thing I think in that one is time frame. Like, you know, obviously that PPP, let's say that in three months from now, they're going to have to fire everybody, but because they got the PPP, they're not going to have to lay everybody off for six months. Okay. But the, let, let's say that that extra three month time period is enough for the economy to recover or for, for them to be able to pivot their business. And so you know, it ends up being that they can keep all the employees. That's going to happen in some cases. There are also going to be businesses where they take the PPP, people come back on payroll, and then they still have to let them go. And so again, I mean, these are just all the things that all these business owners are thinking about anyway, but, and they're really important considerations for them right now, but they're not documenting it and they need to be prepared to answer, you know? Um, I think it's like, again, it's unlikely, but I think it's, it's smart to get this stuff down at this point. Was anyone hired who was unemployed? Uh, so that's a key one too. I mean, you know, when you look at some of these businesses that had to go remote, right? Did they need to hire anyone different to be able to support the business operations in a remote environment? Okay. Possibly. Did they have to pivot their business to go into a new vertical? Did they hire someone? Possibly. Were those people unemployed? Were they unemployed as a result of the coronavirus? How many employees did your business save as a result of bringing them on that were unemployed from the coronavirus. So that's also very much in the spirit of this whole thing is, okay, if you had to, because you know, we can't, it's not like nobody's hiring anybody. Some people laid off uh, 20 people and hired three because the way that their business is gonna succeed going forward needed a different talent mix. Okay, great. So document the terminations, document the new hires, bringing people off. You know, and that, and then also there's all, I mean, during this time, there's unbelievable amount of, you know, performance related terminations because it's a stressful time and people, not everybody knows how to handle things. Right. And so, you know, you've got all those same things going on as well. Um, and then, you know, I put this here as well. Like there, there's going to be other things for you to consider with your clients. You know, I mean, this is by no means a complete list. Um, these are just some things that I think are, are, you know, that came through my mind. Okay. So once you go through with them and you, you have this conversation, um, I would recommend, you know, encouraging them to write this down in a memo. Um, you can share your thoughts with them and your considerations. And then what I would recommend doing is I would recommend taking these steps in substantiating the good faith. Okay. Now, um, I, again, this does not in and of itself guarantee good faith, right? But I think this is, is key. 
The person making the certification should prepare a memo noting their reason for making the certification, including supporting documentation. This may be scrutinized months or years into the future. Documentation should be made now while it's fresh in their mind. So I've been saying that all along, but I do think that that is so key, okay? Once they have that memo, okay, they need to get a written opinion from their attorney based on their specific circumstances. You know, I've seen in the news situations where, um, like I saw an example of a homeowners association where everybody in the homeowners association voted to take the PPP, okay? But the attorney said, no, you shouldn't take it based on your circumstances. Okay, so probably it's not a good idea to take it. But if that business owner wants to take it, thinks it's right, in good faith, makes the certification, reaches out to their attorney, explains the circumstances associated with their situation, gets confirmation from their attorney, I think that makes it much harder for someone to say that person didn't act in good faith. You know, writing a memo, uh, reaching out to their attorney, their attorney agrees. I also think involving key team members in the decision-making process. Now, remember what is the purpose of the PPP, right? It is to keep people employed. So obviously the owners of the business need to be involved in making the decision. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Uh, you know, the, the owner of the business is making that certification. But, you know, remember, there could be multiple owners and we want to make sure that all of those people kind of have a say in, in the situation. If there's any management, they probably could be involved in the decision making process and the employees, I think, should be involved in the decision making process. So think about it like this. You know, a lot of people in the world right now know about the PPP. I even saw P. Diddy had some sort of service related to the PPP. So. This is mainstream, okay? So most employees have heard about this. And I think if the business owner makes the decision on their own, remember guys, the main people that are affected by the PPP are the employees. It's going to allow that business owner to either keep people employed that would not have been employed or extend the date of the layoff if there ends up needing to be one inevitably, okay? And so I think that, you know, for that owner to involve the other people who will be affected by it, I think is another sign of good faith. You know, I mean, the way we saw it in our company, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit about our, uh, you know, thought process and decision-making process and what we ended up doing here in a second. Um, frankly, it affects the employees. Like, you know, if we got a PPP loan and it, let's say we, in my company, I think about it, if we didn't get a PPP loan, right? And then six months down the line, something bad happens or one month down the line, something bad happens where we get to the point where we have to do layoffs. Well, that's bad for the employees, but me as the business owner, I might not be as negatively affected as them, okay? But let's say I do take the loan, then I can, oh my gosh, well, wow, I was gonna have to do layoffs in, in the next, 30 days, now I can extend that to four months. And by the four months, time rolls around, the economy has recovered or the business has recovered or we've made an effective pivot or whatever combination of factors. And so I think it it's it's partially the employee's decision, even though they're not involved in the uh, actual certification and, and all of that. Um, but I do think it's smart to involve them in that decision, especially because there's such controversy around it. Like, what do they want? Do they think that you as a company should receive that money to extend the safety of the company to extend the time that they'll be employed? Or do they think, no, other people need that money more. We as a company are going to fight for this and, and we want to give it to somebody else. We don't want that, knowing that that will put us more at risk. I think involving them is smart because I think it affects the employees more than anybody. And also I would consider, you know, if the employees or management obviously own some of the company or will own some of the company, I think it's a good consideration as well. And there may be other steps, you know, to um, consider, okay, when you, when you go through the process. Remember that the intent of this is to protect employees and payroll involving them in the decision making process may be something to consider. Um, I personally think it's smart. We did a survey of all of our employees. Um, there's a company called Qualtrics that does, I think they're doing like free employee surveys right now. That's a great tool during the coronavirus. And we took one of those little Qualtrics surveys. We sent it out to everybody. We, we put a memo together on what, what do you think we should do? We sent it out to all of our employees. We had them vote. We held a, an hour long AMA and I'll talk about all that in a second. Um, and then remember, this is another uh, piece here and this is from the interim final rule. I further certify that the information provided in this application, I think this was actually on the, um, you know, if we come in here as well, uh, was it here? Yeah, 
I further certify the information provided in this application, all supporting documentation is true and accurate. I understand making a false statement to obtain a guaranteed loan is punishable by law, by imprisonment of not more than five years, up to 250,000, you know, so on and so forth, okay? So, you know, th they're saying that if you violate this good faith certification or any other information in the application, there's harsh penalties. And then remember, going back to the FAQ 31, to the extent that any borrower is concerned about the possible scrutiny of its prior certification. So let's say one of your clients made the certification, got the loan, they're worried about it. Um, the SBA issued new interim rule, which allows a safe harbor whereby borrowers can repay the PPP loans in full May 20, uh, by May 7th and shall be deemed to have made their certification in good faith. Now, I I've been talking about this with some people. I don't think it's really possible to repay the loans by May 7th if, if your client already has funds. But I think if they make a good faith effort, like they reach out to the bank, they send an email because these banks are still not even paying out the loan proceeds in, you know, completely, right? Much less now trying to create a process to get the loans repaid. I mean, but if that person is actively making an effort to, to give that money back, um, even if it's probably a couple of days later, I think they'll probably be fine. Although I would try, if they do determine that they want to do that, I would try to have them do that on or before May 7th. So, Guys, I want to take any questions on this. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, let me know in the chat. You know, we went through this with our company, and I think a lot of you guys have obviously considered this for your companies as well, and I've been getting questions about it. I'm going to walk you through a little bit about what we did, okay? And um, basically, I will uh, – let me see here. I'm going to come back and share my screen here. I'll, I'll walk you guys through a little bit about what we did. And this is where I kind of put this together because I think the way that we did it was helpful, okay? Now, when this thing first came out, you know, obviously none of us really knew as much then as we did now, right? And so, you know, I emailed my attorneys and I said, hey, what do you think we should do in regards to this? And, you know, that was, you know, I think now that we're at this sort of stage of the game, we know so much. I think having the client note everything down in a memo is smart, but I just emailed my attorneys and got their advice. And so I just can't, I can't overestimate, I think, the importance if anybody's even remotely worried about this, given their situation, to just like get your attorney's advice and then but share the details and facts of, of the situation with your attorney. So I spoke with my attorney and I wrote a, I wrote a memo at that point in time that had less information than the memo that we have been working on now. But that memo had sort of relevant information up until that point in time with the problems that we've had in our that we had in our business. And we had some pretty substantial decline in sales in the first month, uh, the first couple of weeks of March, which as you guys saw me in the second half of March fighting like hell, it was a large part because number one, I could see, holy shit, sales are going down. And I even remember I had a consultation with a guy in the middle of March and the guy said, you know, I need to see how this whole thing goes. And I said, okay, well, what I guess in a month from now, um, let's say that they say, oh, it's going to take five more months. Would you join up with us then? He said, oh, no, that'd be another story, right? And that's basically where we are, right? I mean, this is over a month ago, and this is looking like it's going to take like some more time, right? So I, I, I sort of had this realization, you know, sales were substantially down in the first half of uh, March for us in the first couple of weeks leading up to us going remote. And I told Amanda one day, I said, you know, baby, this is not going to be good for our business. This is not going to be good for our business at all. If this continues, like at first I thought, ah, we'll be okay. You know, we're not a restaurant, blah, blah, blah. Like, but I started to realize like, this is not going to be good. This is going to hit us and it's going to hit us really hard. And so I told her that one day and in the next couple of days, the next three or four days is when we started to pivot our business to all of this, um, uh, the EIDL stuff and, some of the and some of the uh, other services that we started doing in the really the middle of May, right? And luckily, that pivot was something that you know business owners were willing to pay for, accounting firms were willing to pay us money to come on board and work with us, and so we were able to generate new revenue, even though our existing business was seeing a decline in new sales and an increase in cancellations, because we were seeing a decline in new sales and an increase in cancellations, right? And we were able to pivot the business into this new area. And I think a lot of us are in this situation that we've never been in before. And, you know, we don't intend on going to for a long period of time. And so that went on for a while. And then they started talking about this PPP. And before I even emailed our, our, our attorney, 
I wrote a memo and the memo was internal to our company. And once I saw the rules associated with the PPP that we knew early on, I wrote that memo and we had our leadership team meeting, uh, which was a couple of days before the application was live. And I laid out all the facts and circumstances associated with our financial situation and the sales declines, the sales increases that we'd had from pivoting. And I said, do you guys want, I said this to my leadership team, do you guys want me to write this memo or continue writing this memo and send it to our attorney to have them go through and tell us what, tell us if they think we should do it. And they all said, yes, unanimous, right? So everybody on our leadership team, and you got to remember when you ask your team members who the thing is really meant to support, there's not a lot of downside for them in saying yes, because it'll just extend the date of their layoff if it does eventually come, right? So I spoke to my leadership team first. I said, do you guys think we should do this? They said, yes. Sent the memo to the attorney, took him like a day to respond. He wrote this long memo back to me saying, based on the facts and circumstances associated with your situation and the uncertainty associated with this, I do recommend that you take it, okay? So that happened. Now, over the subsequent weeks, I have seen all the guidance coming out. And I went back to him, my attorney, and I emailed him again another memo because I was like, okay, well, facts and circumstances have changed, you know. Um, and for us, you know, we had our original business, which was collapsing, our pivot business, which had an increase in sales, right? But then our pivot business also started declining pretty substantially in sales and is much lower now than where it was even a month ago, which I think a lot of you have seen too, right? Because when you initially, when we all initially pivoted to this particular business, you, we saw an increase in sales, a decrease in the existing business, increase in this business, but now a subsequent decrease in sales for some of us. And not all, depending on, I mean, there's so many different people in the group, right? So I went back to him and said, hey, here's an updated memo based on our circumstances. Do you still think that we should take it? I got on the phone. He still thought we should take it. But I still felt like, you know, in our organization, I wanted to do everything that I could to make the right decision and to you know, do it in good faith. And, and here's basically what I got down to, okay? I thought about it for our company and I thought, all right, well, if we don't take it, then I avoid any potential legal issues for myself. And I also avoid any potential reputational issues because I could really see that, you know, you know, if we end up not needing it in the future, when you look back two years from now, would there be any legal repercussions? Would there be any uh, reputational repercussions? And you can't predict the future. But I think, you, like I said, you need to be prepared to answer for this in a deposition. And I said, okay, so those are the things that I would be protecting against if I did not take the loan. On the other side of it, you know, I look at, we have, you know, up to $125,000 a week in payroll, okay? There's only so many weeks I can make $125,000 a month in payroll before, you know, things have to change, right? If, and if there's a deterioration in sales. And so I looked at all my team members, and I thought on the other side of it, if we do take the loan on the other side of it, their timeline for a layoff would get extended if we got to the point where we had to do layoffs. OK. And so I looked at that, too, and I thought I started thinking that on the one side, this affects me, Andrew argue, but on the other side, this affects every single person in my company. And so what I decided to do was I wrote another memo that was for the entire company and I set up a ask me anything. We already do these in our companies, but I call it an emergency ask me anything. And this was really like right after the Shake Shack news and some of the other things had come out. And a lot of people in our group were chatting about it, like talking about what they thought about Shake Shack and all this. So I thought, gee, you know, why don't we do this transparently? And so I set up a one hour ask me anything where I first presented to them where we are at in regards to this decision. The fact that the leadership team wanted to do it, the attorneys wanted to do it. Um, given the fact that, you know, what are some of the risks associated with the business, how some of our products and programs have had a decline in sales and they have not returned. Some of our new programs have had an increase in sales, but a subsequent decline in sales and the future is unknown. Kind of going through all these considerations and I let them ask me questions for an hour, open-ended, okay? And at the end of that, we had the memo, right? And then at the end of that, I had everybody do a survey, okay? Everybody do a survey and I let them all vote anonymously on whether or not they thought we should take the loan or we should not take the loan. Um, and so I think that, and I put this in there about the way to make the decision. I think first off in your mind, thinking about it, asking your leadership team, you know, writing up a memo, sending it to your attorney, getting your attorney's approval. And I think involving your entire team, which by the way, it's really for them in making the decision. Okay. 
Now, the other aspect to all this, which, you know, I've thought a little bit about as well, is that, you know, let's think about the future, okay? What's going to happen with this stuff? Let's say you take the loan today and you need it immediately or in the coming days or weeks. Okay, great. You know, it's dispersed and everything. And you want to make sure, obviously, and this goes to a whole other conversation about the forgiveness, you get that dispersed in a way in which it's going to be forgiven. Now, some businesses are structurally just based on the way they terminated people, based on the low sales that they have, they're just not going to be able to get 100% of it forgiven. That's just going to be the case for some people. And then they need to make a decision about that remaining portion and say, okay, do I just want to pay that back because I don't want any debt? Or do I want to take that debt and use it to fund the rest of their operations and then have that be real debt that is paid back over a longer period of time? Okay. And those are all decisions that people have to make. But you know, if you or your client takes a loan right now for the PPP, they can make a decision, you know, to get 100% of that forgiven, to get a portion of it forgiven, and to spend it in that way. And even if it's spent in a way where 100% is forgiven, they can still decide to pay back the loan proceeds, right? And so let's say, for example, that the uncertainty at the time of the certification was high, but the time of the forgiveness there's no uncertainty. They've regained their certainty about their business's ability to succeed over the medium or the long term. They might decide to pay back that loan. They might decide not to take the forgiveness. And so I think you're going to see some people do that, where by the time June rolls around, hopefully there will be more stability in things. I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, I don't think that's going to be the case, but you don't have to see. And I think a lot of this forgiveness is going to go into July, August, September, October, because these banks are going to be so backed up and, you know, people are getting the money at a certain time. It starts from the eight weeks they get it, you know, and so on. And so I think if somebody gets the loan now, they have future dates to be able to make decisions. And so let's say that, you know, July rolls around and they decide they don't need it. They can pay the money back. Right. And we talked about that in our case. We could pay the money back. Let's say that at that point in time, we spent it the right way. We want to get it forgiven. We get it forgiven. But then in the future, you decide, OK, no, maybe we want to pay it back. Or let's say at some point down the line, you know, you end up having had it forgiven, but like there's going to be people. And I, I use this example sometimes where they had a full service Mexican restaurant and that full service Mexican restaurant basically collapses. They restart, you know, a micro location with takeout and going forward, they end up creating something that's as big as Chipotle, right? They might end up saying like, oh my gosh, like this PPP thing, it helped us through this period. They might end up doing some charitable work related to this down the line because this sort of saving, they say, we're committed to doing X, Y, and Z charity, right? So I think there's a lot of interesting ways for these business owners to think of it. And, you know, when they go through this process, you know, those loan proceeds should be used to support the ongoing operations of the business. Um, they should do everything that they can to make a good faith certification. If they can get on the other end of this thing and they can help people, if they pivot their business now, if they pivot their business in the future, they should do it. Um, and basically, those are some of my thoughts on it. You know, for us, our team did make the decision to go forward and do it at this point, but we've got all these different checkpoints down the line where we're going to check in and see what we want to do. And so I think that the decision itself, in my mind, is not as important as how you made it. Okay. And so, I think anybody should be willing to respond for it. I wanted to not only be transparent with the attorneys, I want to be transparent with our um, leadership team. I want to be transparent with all of our employees and I want to be transparent with all of you guys. You know, and, and you know, I mentioned this earlier on, but all of this information will be online. You know, all of this, you will be able to see and you know how the information comes out, whether it comes out of like, okay, these people took the loans or these people, these people took the loans and they were forgiven. All the EINs associated with this will be online. And so you'll be able to look up anybody. You could look up any company that takes the loans. When that information will be available, <laughs> who knows, right? I mean, the way that all this stuff is gone, but it will be available online. So if you or your clients want to take the loans, okay, want, want to take the loans, whether or not you want to get them forgiven, that information will be public. You want to be able to answer to that to the public, to the community, to the regulators, to the SBA, to the bank, and so on, okay? So you want to make sure to have all this stuff documented. So I hope that that was helpful for you guys. I know a lot of people have had questions on that. And so I figured I would be as transparent with you guys as I could and try to provide some insights and guidance. I think we did a good job in the way that we made the decision. And we'll have to see how things uh, play out on a go forward basis. I think the fundamental reason why I think it, it makes sense is because of 
the way that we asked every single person that was involved with our organization. But if you look at my mentality, a lot of you guys know this from, from watching my stuff, I mean, I think this is going to be a very long-term problem. I don't think you're going to see any substantial economic recovery in 2020. I don't think the worst of the economic issues is done. I don't think, I, I would never have imagined that this would have happened this year. If you'd have told me this is gonna happen, I said, you're a conspiracy theorist. I would have, I would have probably thought that. I would have thought, yeah, that's just a little bit extreme. So we are into territory now that I could not have imagined. And if you would have told me, I, I would not have believed that they would have ratcheted down the economy, locked you know, 3 billion people in their homes and so on. And so I don't know what's coming next. And I am definitely scared. I, I'm definitely afraid. I think I have a healthy fear, not a fear that cripples me and, and keeps me cooped up in my house, but a fear that makes me really trying to stay on top of everything and hold it all together, okay? And so um, with that, if you guys have any questions, let me know in the chat. Let me see here if you guys have any questions. And I will paste the link to this Good Faith Certification document so you guys can have this. Um, you can either send it to your clients. Um, if you end up doing this as part of the uh, certification, or sorry, as part of the forgiveness or as part of any part of the engagements, obviously you can help them out with uh, putting some of this stuff together. And, you know, as that May 7th date comes up, if any clients feel like they're uncomfortable with it, then, you know, they can sort of make the determination at that point in time and they can, they can pay it back. All right, let me see here. So if you guys have any questions, um, you can let me know in the group. I will get the um, uh, document posted and we'll go from there. All right, guys. Talk soon.